Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everyone. Beautiful beloveds. Good morning. It is such a joy and a pleasure to share space with you today. I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I can't believe technology allows us to do this. So it is good to share this sacred space with all of you. For those of you who don't know me, um, I use the reverend in front of my name, not because I'm a reverend, although I am. I like to use it as a verb because I have the deepest reverence for life. I want to share a foundational story with you that some of you have heard because you have known me for a few years, um, but I share it again because it frames so much of what I believe in and what I teach about as a religious naturalist minister. This story took place during my first year of seminary when I was working as a chaplain not too far from you at Wake Forest Baptist Hospital. And one day when I was outside, a nurse asked me about my denomination. And I said to her, I am a Unitarian Universalist. And she's like, a uni what? I never heard of that. Are you a Christian? She said, and I said, I am not, although I value Christianity. She says, then what do you believe in? And so I pointed to a dandelion that was growing through a crack in the sidewalk. And I said to her, I believe in the force that makes that dandelion grow through a crack in the sidewalk. I believe in that resilient life force, that almost stubborn life force. I believe that it is the same life force that makes everything possible. The sunbeams coming through the trees, the air we breathe, the food we eat. And the nurse nodded and seemed satisfied with the answer. And I felt like I had scored some points or something with her. But I share that story often because yes, I have the deepest reverence for the life force that runs through dandelions and through every living thing on this planet, including you and me. Cultures around the world have called this animating force inside of us by various names, Shakti, Prana, She, Spirit. I simply call it aliveness or life force or vitality. And I believe that this life force is sacred since I believe that God is the creativity of the cosmos that created the universe and continues to create through us. And so I believe that whatever oppresses our life force, whatever gets in the way of its flourishing needs to be examined and dismantled. And so the question is, what keeps us from our vitality, from our aliveness, from the full experience of our inheritance as living organisms on this planet? What gets in the way? And well, the answer is many different things, but as a minister, I look at the theologies that are degrading to who we are as individuals. I look at the social biases and the stereotypes that makes us feel small. I look at our loss of meaning and purpose in life, which can lead to existential depression. Existentially, when we have seen certain things, when we live through certain things, when we understand certain things, it gets harder to sustain our joy and our vitality. Our heart, thank you for that beautiful story, Pam, right? Our, our, a change happens to our heart. But it's also, it can also be that at some point in our lives, it is harder for us to find meaning in the things that once gave meaning to our lives. Existentially also, it's hard for our heart to fully sit with the state of our current world, socially, and also planetarily, ecologically. It's really hard for our hearts. But there is hope, beloveds. Truly, there is hope. We are building a new way. 
there is a great wave happening all over the world, a wave of change, moving us away from the systems that rob us from our life force that, and that also extract from Pachamama, Mother Earth, Madre Tierra. And with this new shift, we are implementing new frameworks. We are embracing new teachings, new theologies, new practices, new lifestyles that are life-giving, that are not about extraction, but about nurturing, nurturing life, including our own life force. And so in that spirit, I bring to you today a framework that has helped me balance my existential agonies with the ecstasies. I call it savoring and serving, savoring and serving. And I picture it as an infinity sign. Let's see if you can see it, savoring and serving life. Savoring as a way of seeing how life loves us and serving as a way of loving life back. Savoring really is about mindfulness, about paying attention to what is in front of us. The mangoes on the kitchen counter call me to them with their scent. Savoring mangoes has been a coping mechanism for me during this pandemic. Savoring is about using all of our senses, coming home to our senses. And this often begins with wonder. I wonder if the mangoes are ready. I wonder which intelligence designed the 10,000 taste buds on my tongue for our savor and pleasure. I wonder how photosynthesis works how the mango is able to use the energy of the sun that is coming through the window and converts it into sugar to give me energy, to give me vitality, to give me this little bit of joy that helps me get through a pandemic, through a winter in Michigan. It almost feels like love. But back to wonder. I go to the botanical garden to see the butterflies this spring and I wonder, I wonder what is that sage green little thing with a golden necklace inside a fairy house? It is mesmerizing. Is it a little tiny toy? It is so perfect and so shiny, absolutely perfect. It's the chrysalis of a monarch butterfly, of course. I mean, awe. Oh. One of my favorite books from seminary, Growing Up Absorb is the title. It talks about religious education as this quality of engagement and absorption with life. The author Richard Gilbert calls this process of absorption spiritual osmosis. I personally call it intimacy with life, intimacy with life. Richard Gilbert believed that religious education happens throughout our entire lives, as Pam's title beautifully explained, lifetime, lifespan religious education. So he says, how long does it take to grow a soul, to love and to be loved and to help repair the world? How long? I love that quote. And so this level of absorption, of engagement, of intimacy, help us keep growing our soul at any age. Savoring is also about intimacy with our own bodies, our own feelings, being able to recognize when our bodies are depleted, when our life force is faint, it's also about emotional intelligence, being able to identify and be present with our emotions in order to heal them. Now, on this other side, I've been talking about savoring for a little bit, but on the other side here, we have serving, serving life. 
And this side of the infinitive symbol is about giving life, giving love life to the web of life. It's about getting proximate to situations that are not as sweet as a mango, as cute as a butterfly, but that are still very much part of our lives. Serving is about wonder too. I wonder about the lives of my neighbors. I wonder about the experiences of my black friends. I wonder what it's like to transition from one gender to another. I wonder what it's like down at the border. And so I get proximate. As a practice, I get closer. So wonder is a posture, an orientation in life. And I love what the writer Valerie Kaur says that wonder is the wellspring for love. Wonder is the wellspring for love. So serving is about doing what we can to alleviate the suffering of others. It's about the practices that promote well-being for all of life. It's the moral responsibility to care for and protect all of creation, including Mother Earth, Pasha Mama, Madre Tierra. Those of us who consider ourselves religious naturalists, I know there's some of you are religious naturalists as well. Those of us who consider ourselves religious naturalists see the earth as sacred, not because it is omnipotent, but because it is vulnerable and precious and of tremendous value to us. So savoring and serving, savoring and serving. I find more balance in life when I practice both. When I'm in this flow from one side to the other. If I savor too much, I become selfish. It's all about me and my hunger and my appetite for life. And I do have an appetite for life. If it's all about savoring, I consume and consume and we know what overconsumption does. What harm it causes to the web of life. But if I serve too much, I get depleted. I get depressed. My life force gets depressed. And I feel powerless. If all I see and experience is pain and struggle and trauma, my brain begins to associate life with that because of neuroplasticity. I'm fascinated and obsessed with neuroscience these days because it is the new frontier of spirituality. It is a new frontier for spirituality, in my opinion, because never before have we had such concrete tools to help us understand the, our human condition, for understanding what creates suffering and what alleviates it. Neuroplasticity brings great news to help us heal ourselves and the world. I call it the gospel of neuroplasticity. Some of you have heard that. Because it's amazing that we have been given this power to rewire our brains. With enough practice, we can change our brains, our habits, our lifestyles, and our societies. We are building a new way, and it is in this way. And it begins in our brains, in our habits, in our mindsets. The not so great news about the brain is that there is also this thing called the negativity bias, which means that our brains are like Velcro for negative experiences and like Teflon for positive experiences. So in order for something pleasant to stick to our brains, we must do it over and over and over again. This is why mindfulness or savoring is so important. So because of this negativity bias is so strong, it attaches any negative experience, it attaches itself like Velcro, right? It is so strong. It is essential then that we balance the agonies, the existential agonies with the ecstasies that we take in the good things in life as well. If all the brain sees is pain and struggle, it begins to rewire itself that way, and that is dangerous, as you know. 
So a framework such as savoring and serving, savoring and serving, help us find a healing balance. This is one of the reasons I intentionally create moments of beauty and wonder. These are things that the current systems of oppression have deemed inferior, but I see it as a human necessity, as a way to resist, as a survival strategy, and as a way to connect with our vitality and our aliveness. Also as a way to balance out the heartbreak I encounter daily. And so beautiful beloveds, that is my invitation to you. May you wonder, may you savor, may you serve as a way of healing yourself and the planet, as a spiritual practice, as a social responsibility, as a way to activate the life force within you and to give back generously to the web of life. Because yes, we are building a new way. Come and go with me to that land.